And welcome back everyone to Entrepreneuring. I'm Garrett Weinzerl and my guest today is the owner and operator of El Campo Clothing. Welcome to the show, Gabriel Mendez. Thanks, Garrett. It's good to be here. I appreciate it. I'm glad you could uh, I'm glad you could join us today. So, I'm going to start this off with the obvious question. What exactly is El Campo? That's an excellent uh, that's an excellent beginning. El Campo Clothing is a locally owned and operated clothing company uh, with an emphasis in social enterprise. Uh, we look toward making clothing from organic cotton using organic dye stuffs again that's locally made specifically um, in the future with an, a workforce that's comprised of of homeless people um, I'd like to be able to provide job training opportunities for some folks who don't necessarily have some some steady work available to them and I think that also opens up some other avenues uh, later on down the line for for some other opportunities with homeless people to provide low and no cost clothing what what led you to to that being being your goal as a as a business owner? Um, well, originally I had wanted to work with a pretty diverse group of people, um, the formerly incarcerated women, minorities, and what I realized is that homeless people, especially here in Las Cruces, comprise that entire group, um, and so we have quite a few of them. We do a lot of outreach here in in Las Cruces for homeless people. And I think it's something that fits really well with my own personal mission, um, again, as well as a need here in our community. Wow, oh, that's that's a that's a great place to start. I think as a as you're moving into your business and, and realizing you need a workforce. I mean, that's very very noble. Definitely, I um I mean it's it's personally motivated as well. I do. I've always wanted to own my own business. Um, my girlfriend is a, is a community organizer, so she's very heavily involved in social justice and community advocacy. And so it's something that we share and something that we're working toward together. Uh, her more, definitely more boots on the ground, and I definitely more from a business or enterprise aspect. Okay. All right. So while we're kind of on the subject of being socially responsible, what other, what other steps are you taking with your business to, to stay, stay with that? Definitely. Like I mentioned, um, I have a great interest in organic cotton. We farm a lot of organic cotton here in the valley, um, and I'm working on getting more involved with that. Um, we also, I mean, we're an agricultural hub here in the Mesilla Valley, and so there's no reason that we can't be moving toward more uh, sustainable agricultural practices, especially with regard to clothing, um, specifically dye stuffs. Um, pecans in particular, we grow a lot of pecans here, and uh, those make a beautiful dye. They range in color from a dark brown all the way to a lovely sort of salmon pink. Um, and there's no reason that we couldn't be utilizing that and other dye stuffs as well. Um, in addition, hopefully, if legislation frees it up, if we move toward some hemp legalization, I'd love to be able to grow some hemp here as well. Hemp is a wonderful clothing product. It grows faster than cotton. It's better for the land than cotton. takes less water. Um, so it's significantly more sustainable than cotton. And again, like I said, if legislation frees that up, I'd like to be able to move into um, organic hemp farming as well. Um, so like I said, agriculture in this particular vertical, right, clothing, um, agriculture is, is the base of the pyramid. And so there's no, no reason why we shouldn't be using that to our full advantage here. Right. In fact, historically, sorry, historically, we have a rather uh, large textile industry that used to be here. Uh, El Paso was a textile hub. There was a lot of clothing manufacturing there, um, and so there's no reason that we can't regrow that tradition. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, uh, it, is you were talking about uh, the hemp legislation? Is there any chance for for voting coming up? Um, so our legislation, our legislative session has already ended. Um, there was a um, there was a uh, not a ballot measure or a referendum. There was a, a bill rather that would have legalized hemp farming that unfortunately was struck down in this particular legislative session. Um, I think with a little bit more lobbying on our part, um, we can point out with some lobbying and some education, public education of course, we can point out the differences between marijuana and hemp and how hemp is a much different product, right. um, a much safer product, a much more uh, publicly secure product that um, there's no reason to be legislating against that. All right. Yeah, I I, I agree. I, there's a there's a big disconnect there. 
Was, Absolutely. I, I there think, is a big disconnect in the I, public mind. I think my first exposure to it was you know, like at a concert, and it was the most hippie-looking booth I had ever seen. But since then, did some research, and it's like, well, no, you can make very normal clothing from this, and it's, Absolutely. it's quite sustainable. Very sustainable. It's much more durable than cotton, lasts longer, it's easier to process. There's so many more benefits to it. In addition, it has many more industrial uses than cotton. Cotton's limited to two or three post-production uses, whereas hemp can go on and be used for a bunch of other things. Right. So going, going back to, to working with the local homeless population, how, what, how have you gone about learning you know, how to be part of that outreach? Uh, I'm assuming your, your girlfriend's come into, you know, has been quite helpful in that in some, some way, shape, or form, because you said she did work uh, locally with that type of, those type of programs. Right. So she's involved with a, a group called Comunidades en Acción y de Fe, which translates to Communities in Action and Faith. Um, their acronym is CAFE. They're a group here in town, a fairly powerful uh, social justice uh, community advocacy group here in town, uh, who I've also been in talks with um, to move toward uh, a social enterprise. That's who she works for. Um, she works with a group and with a number of different groups, actually. Um, her current focus is with a group in Vado, New Mexico, to help them get some uh, infrastructure that they need. They have a pretty dire problem with their roads. Um, every year the roads flood and it's caused, um, it's actually, it's led to the deaths of some folks. Uh, emergency personnel can't get out there when it rains. Um, it's led to a lot of economic problems for the folks that live out there. The, the county has been really reticent to do anything to help. Um, and so she's made a lot of headway getting, getting notoriety for this issue and coming up with some sustainable solutions. The EPA has gotten involved. So that group, CAFE, is really a mover and shaker here in the community, I think is my point. And I really, our relationship is just starting, but I think it would be very, very, um, we share a lot of the same interests to be able to help a pretty wide group of people, whether it's the uh, immigrant or, or, or marginalized communities in, in southern New Mexico, whether that be in Vado or here in Las Cruces, all up and down the valley. So your, 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 your idea is basically to collaborate with, with local outreach programs. Exactly. Uh, I've collaborated with a second group here in town. They're known as Kaleidoscope. Um, the person who runs that, her name is Naoma Staley. We've started growing a relationship as well. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for social enterprise, nonprofit funding um, here in the, in the valley. A lot of, of um, foundations, uh, um, charitable foundations, are interested in seeing economic development in our area. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's going to be something that's very necessary in our future especially if we uh, if we feel if we find ourselves needing to grapple with um, sudden economic changes sudden economic downturns a flexible a strong adaptable flexible local economy is really going to be our best defense um, in 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 against any kind of those economic downturns that we are fairly certain to see in the future um, and that is only going to make our community stronger and that's definitely something that i'm trying to be a part of now when it comes to collaboration was was that something that always came naturally to you, or, or is this a learned skill as you as you <laughs> got into your question no that's a learned skill i for a long time worked in the dark of night alone uh, by myself sewing clothes doing creative stuff um creativity is not new to me i was always creative as a child but really didn't find my hit my stride so to speak until about 2005, my mom gave me my first sewing machine. Um, I was always looking for a creative outlet, trying this, that, or the other, painting, sculpting, drawing, you name it. And she gave me a sewing machine. She's like, here, try this. And I taught myself how to use it and, and realized, hey, wow, this is what I want to be doing. And never looked back. It's been 11 years, um, and I've spent at least a portion of every day working on a sewing machine, doing something with fabric, learning about fabric, learning about the textile and apparel industry. Um, and so I can safely consider myself an expert after 11 years <laughs> in the industry. Um, but yeah, no, collaboration is, is definitely something that's a little bit newer. I'm definitely in a relationship growing phase of the business. 
Okay. All right. Any any tips for for would be entrepreneurs out there who are you know m- maybe like you they're they're or or honestly like me a little more accustomed to working on their own and, and doing their own thing. Um, once once you do it, it feels like the most natural thing in the world. Um, I was always a pretty staunch lone wolf, um, and after a few meetings, a few one on ones, as we call them in the in the community organizing industry, um, after after a few one on ones, you realize, hey, I'm just sitting down to talk to people. I'm just you know learning about other people one on one, literally one on one. Um, and that's how you're going to make a difference. Uh, so once you do it, it comes naturally. Um, and you just have to do it. You just have to sit down and have the one-on-one. I think often we forget in business, especially our our generation, I think, we forget that without people, there is, there is no business. You know, It's we, very easy, um, especially yeah. depending on how you market, to get kind of lost in your own world. Absolutely, especially with the prevalence of e-tailing and... Snapchat and Twitter and all this, you're, you know, I mean, we're not even in the same room together. This is actually a really good, you know, illustration kind of of the of the distance between us. But then that's sort of the paradox of it all, too, is that despite, you know, that distance, it's also a major connector. Um, it is, and, and, and it can be, because what we're doing right now, this this is in essence could be networking. You know, I may absolutely. need I may need <laughs> someone who can who can make us some clothes. You may need you know, someone like me with my skill set. But right. If this uh, weren't such an interview, I'd be really interested in in conducting a more uh, reciprocal learning about a little bit more about what you do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that, that's 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 the interesting part. And I think I think that's the that's the line you have to walk, right? When you're obviously that you should I don't think you should uh, stay away from from tools like this and, and not using the Internet, not using social media to your advantage, but also be careful not to fall into the trappings of it. Definitely, definitely. And that's actually something I have to get much better with. I'm a terrible Facebook user. I have a Twitter account for the company and I never post anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm really good at Instagram. And um, yeah, I have a lot of work to do as far as social media is concerned. I find that comes comes naturally to a lot of a lot of folks that run their own businesses. You, you tend to gravitate towards one and then you look at the others just kind of in bewilderment. Uh, like I, I use Twitter all the time, but I kind of look at Facebook like, yeah, that's what my grandma uses, but it's not <laughs> true. It's not that so many people use Facebook. It's just true. A, a personal hang up. I should probably get over. Yeah. We all have our preferences in the creative, especially in the creative community. People tend to use Instagram a lot. A lot of the people that I follow and a lot of the people that follow me are on Instagram and we definitely communicate, communicate quite a bit by Instagram. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. My, my, my wife has such a better grasp on Instagram than I do. Uh, <laughs> she she knows how to how to work that 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 uh, that network definitely. So um, anyway, so getting back to El Campo, uh, we haven't really actually talked about what what you are making. That's an excellent question. I I had some talking points, and I should have I should have brought my little iPad here with me so I could keep track keep better track of what. Oh, no, it's absolutely fine. It, it, it's been <laughs> a very nice kind of natural conversation. I've been, I've been, been I enjoying. Um, El Campo in Spanish means the field. Um, and it's a pretty popular naming convention throughout Spanish-speaking communities, both here in the United States and in Mexico. Um, coincidentally, my girlfriend's family owns a butcher shop and a grocery store in rural northeastern Colorado. And they were considering naming their business um, uh, El Campo Grocery Store. Um, in Spanish, it's Abarrotes y Carnicería uh, uh, El Campo. Before they chose, they settled on the name of their hometown. Um, and I had been thinking about naming this business El Campo before they, before we even were talking about uh, getting a grocery store with a family. So, um, again, it's a fairly common naming convention and the field is a reference to our cross border agricultural heritage, which I've already talked a little bit about. Um, but it also is a, is a, a reference or a hearkening, I suppose, to, um, the, the rigors of the field, clothing that needs to withstand you know, hard-wearing, long-lasting clothing that can really withstand the rigors of the field. And that's the tradition that I'm making clothes in, both the agricultural and sort of Western kind of writing tradition as well. Um, A big part of the Western clothing tradition is customization, custom saddles, custom hats, custom belts, um, especially custom boots. Um, But what we don't see, and, and the reason why we don't see this is because of the sort of the overtake of mass production clothing since the 1960s. Um, 
what we don't see are custom shirts and custom jeans. And uh, we all know that the Western, Western clothing aficionados, whether you're just wearing the look or whether you're using the look out, you know, in the ranch or on the field, um, jeans and, and long sleeve shirts are a really big part of that, uh, especially cotton shirts uh, that breathe, you know, sun protection that can wick away the moisture. Um, so that's uh, kind of what I'm making is is clothing in the Western sort of uh, or agricultural tradition that's very durable. Um, and right now it's a lot of custom tailoring. Um, I'd like to be able to specialize moving forward. I'd like to be able to specialize in um, in custom denim specifically um, and and Western style shirts especially. Uh, but for right now, there's a pretty steady flow of, of custom tailoring, uh, and then that's what's. I think that's what's building some of the notoriety for the business. It's not something that I want to keep doing, maybe for the occasional special client here or there, do a, a custom tailoring job, but I'd like to be able to specialize in denim, especially. So it's something you kind of naturally kind of fell upon while you were building up this business. It wasn't, it wasn't your, necessarily your goal. It sounds like you're sticking with it because it is, it is good business. Absolutely. Um, it wasn't something that I had, I had, when I got into it, I was a custom tailor. I've always identified myself as a custom tailor. And it's something that I've slowly been moving away from. I started as a custom tailor doing bridesmaids' dresses, suits. Um, I sew all my own clothes. The shirt I'm wearing, I sew. If you could see my jeans, I'm, I sewed those as well. Um, and so, it, like I said, it's something that I'm trying to actually move away from. The reason being, like you asked, is because there is a huge market in denim. Um, premium denim, specifically those jeans that are priced at $75 or above, um, are expected to grow at about 8% compound annual growth rate for the next five years, which is pretty impressive. Um, and most people here I've talked to spend $75 or above, especially women, um, spend $75 or above on, on jeans. And so there's no reason that we can't tie in um, the Western, specifically Western wear. They're spending $75 on Western style jeans, heavily embellished, which is not something that I am an advocate of, um, but you know, <laughs> that's what if that's what they want. That's what I'll make. Um, yeah. Anyways, so I think there's a definitely a growing market in the premium denim sector, and there's no reason we can't marry premium denim with premium Western denim. So yeah, it seems like you really did your 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 market research. Uh, you know, how, how important do you think that has been in growing your business? And would you would you recommend other other you know startups go and and definitely definitely research it before they jump in? Um, I jumped in before I did the research. I started making stuff and started making jeans and buying up denim. I was running kind of like, <laughs> I had an art teacher who once said, your instinct is like a loaded gun and you're just running around shooting it off. <laughs> um, and that's kind of what I did. I, I went with my instinct and I was like, everyone's wearing jeans. I'm going to make some jeans. And realized afterward that, hey, there really is a, a viable market for this. It's the interesting um, thing about having... Yeah, if I could do it in reverse, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, that's kind of the interesting thing about having a trade skill. I've, I have a background in graphic design. Oh, uh, right on. And had a kind of a similar, uh, a, a similar chain of events where it's like, well, I didn't plan on doing this, but I keep getting paid to do it, so I'm going to keep doing it. And that's kind of the interesting with like, if you have a trade skill, something you can apply to some type of good, you can find yourself almost without knowing it, becoming a freelancer. Uh, exactly. I actually have a pretty similar background with graphic design myself. Um, I worked for, oh gosh, seven years now as a freelance graphic designer, um, both uh, all over the state actually in Albuquerque and here in Las Cruces, and I agree 100%. <laughs> it's very true. You know, trade skill is very much like that. You, you fall into it as it's needed. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, I, I love hearing that story. I'm like, oh, all right, I'm not alone. I'm not the only person who was like, well, this was my plan, and this is what I ended up with. But um, it's it happens. It's okay. It's okay to I think be kind of fluid in that way. I agree, and I think the creative skill set is kind of fluid in that you have to be able to be able you have to be able to kind of I don't want to say dabble um, because you definitely want to you know become. Uh, more of an expert, you know. I wouldn't call myself an expert graphic designer by any stretch, uh, but yeah, I think it's very fluid. Right. So, 
what what is the future for uh, for El Campo? You're talking you're talking about where you are. Obviously, you want to uh, you've already talked a little bit about going after the 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 custom denim market. Uh, is there anything else kind of waiting in the wings? Definitely. Um, I really want to be able to do a little bit of mass manufacturing myself. Um, like I said, up until the 1960s, uh, early 1970s, uh, about 95% of our clothing was domestically made. And in particular, uh, workwear was, was even more geographically uh, centered, more, more regional. Um, Levi's, for example, is a good example. Uh, they, even though they were a, a national corporation in the 70s, 60s and 70s, they had regional manufacturing hubs and their jeans would have been shipped you know, within two, three hundred miles of their of their regional manufacturing hub, Lee was the same way. Carhartt was the same way. Um, all of these these major companies were very regional, um, and that doesn't even count. So those are major companies. That doesn't even count little, uh, what I would now call mom and pop manufacturing companies, um, labels that people have never even heard of. Now, uh, I, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but. Uh, Stuff that's definitely gone to the wayside. Stuff that doesn't exist anymore. I'm trying, um, I'm trying to think. Jinko. <laughs> yeah, well, Jinko uh, is definitely like 1990s. Um, <laughs> well, I was, I it's the first thing that popped in my head that's not around anymore. <laughs> right. So um, I guess actually Oshkosh Bagash is a good example. They um, they were a very regional Minnesota Minnesota or Michigan company, Michigan-based company. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, that gained a lot of popularity later on. Uh, but originally, you know, shipped maybe to the within their state and 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 a few hundred miles around. Um, and so, what I'd like to be able to do is get back to that. Um, it, so I say mass manufacturing, but in a much smaller sense than we think of global mass manufacturing today. Um, I'd like to be able to offer regional workwear. And of course, the caveat is that anybody can order it online now. So, you know, it's, I say regional mass manufacturing, but it could be, end up being shipped anywhere in the world. Right. There's no reason you couldn't just open up an online store and open up yeah. the whole U.S. market and possibly even Canada. Sure. Absolutely. That having been said, it's not like I'm going to be building, you know, brick and mortar stores in Canada or Detroit or L.A. or something like that. Um, if you want to come to the storefront, the storefront's in Las Cruces, and I think it actually makes that purchase more meaningful. You you stop by the store and got an actual pair of El Campo jeans from the El Campo store, you know, in Las Cruces, New Mexico, as opposed to just going online and ordering them. So there's a there's a definite um, sort of uh, what would you call it Sen sentiment or sentimentality there, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that that also plays into the Western tradition, plays into this, that, that idea of nostalgia. I've also described it as slow-made clothing um, as opposed to fast fashion, which is something that we're seeing today uh, with the growth of H&M and Gap and Walmart and all of these mass manufacturing companies on a global scale that are unfortunately taking advantage of people left and right in third world countries. And it's up to us, it's up to small retailers like me to set a higher standard and when, when people are buying my clothes, they're directly competing with that fast fashion. And they're telling fast fashion, hey, we want something different. We don't want to take advantage of people. We don't want to take advantage of, of our natural resources. And so we create some competition there that's going to also, that's going to hopefully start to keep that fast fashion in line as well. It seems to be a, a trend towards just artisan made goods in general, I feel, in the U.S. anyway. There was an article in The Atlantic not too long ago about how millennials specifically are no longer interested in brand names. Um, what they're interested in is, in, in is an ethic, is a mindset more than a brand name. Um, and I think that's something that we can take advantage of to be able to conserve natural resources and take care of people who need to be taken care of. Yeah, I think I think if you can, you know, if you can bend trends, you know, to your favor while also at the same time you know, making a difference and, and building your business to what what is important to you i think it's it's a win-win absolutely absolutely so uh well gabriel you've been you've been great i've really enjoyed our chat uh if she, you know, if folks are interested in el campo clothing you know how can they keep up to date with you when you're when you're not sitting on a podcast like this <laughs> um 
the website is actually not a really great way to keep up with it. Uh, you're welcome to visit it, get in contact with me uh, via email there. But uh, anything on social media is great. Slash Campo Clothing for everything. So Facebook slash Campo Clothing, Instagram slash Campo Clothing, Twitter at Campo Clothing. Um, so any of that, just Campo Clothing is a Google Campo Clothing. You'll, you'll find us one way or the other. Um, I'm actually going to move my head here out of the way. It's <laughs> the phone number. <laughs> yes. I'll also read it out for our audio only listeners. It's a 505-715-7367. There you go. So go uh, I'm, I'm, I love to text message. I'll answer the phone on the first ring. So I, I, I'm a very direct. Having done the uh, one-on-ones now, having figured out the collaboration, um, uh, the phone is really a good direct way to get hold. <laughs> I'm about to say that is very unique. You're literally giving out your cell phone number uh, as a, as a form a of marketing so, radio show here. Yep, exactly. So, so, so if folks want to send you an emoji of a smiley face, they can do that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, Gabriel, uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, again, everyone, check out CampoClothing.com and Campo Clothing everywhere on the internet. Just uh, give it a quick Google. Uh, and and go check it out. Some 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 great stuff. So, uh, thank you again for your time. Thank you everyone for listening. Do not forget to subscribe, and we will see you next time. Thanks, Garrett.